Good morning, and welcome to Radically Real Remote. I'm Terry Williams, President and COO of the Keene Sentinel. The Hannah Grimes for Entre Center for Entrepreneurship and the Sentinel partner each year to stage this event, which grew out of a gathering of key supporters of Hannah Grimes nearly 20 years ago. I am speaking to you this morning also on behalf of Marianne Christensen, Executive Director for Hannah Grimes, who provides so much of the energy, creativity, and vision behind Radically Rural. You will see Marianne later today back on this virtual stage. We are pleased and fortunate to be with you today, and by fortunate, I mean really fortunate, in what has been an incredibly challenging time. Despite the pandemic, we have planned a packed event that features 500 registrants, nearly 80 expert panelists, 18 sessions, our first lore livability idea slam, all between the bookends of two outstanding keynote speakers. Right at the top, I wanna to thank this year's sponsors. Our leadership sponsors are the New Hampshire Business Finance Authority and CNS Wholesale Grocers. Our track sponsors are Savings Bank of Walpole, Muscoma Bank, and Franklin Pierce University. It's important to note that student journalists from Franklin Pierce are covering today's event and will help the Sentinel produce a 24 page tab tomorrow on today's conversations. The Lore Foundation is sponsoring the Lore Livability Idea Slam. And we are supported by Cummings Printing, Cheshire County Conservation District, Monadnock Sustainability Hub, Monadnock Economic Development Corporation, Prime Rose Coffee Company, Arts Alive, the New England Newspaper and Press Association, Art of the Rural, and New Hampshire PBS. We're so grateful for their generosity and interest in this event and their encouragement despite the impact of the pandemic on so many of us, our businesses, and our communities. Radically Rural is about sharing ideas, about innovation, and about how to elevate the economic, social, and cultural conditions of small communities everywhere. Our track leaders, whom I will thank in a bit, have tapped their local, regional, and national networks to assemble our most impressive group of speakers and panelists yet to discuss making downtowns more vibrant, bolstering local arts and cultural enterprises, giving entrepreneurs a lift, finding footing for local news organizations, celebrating the land and its sustainability, and moving communities to cleaner and renewable energy sources. Radically Rural is a project of the Hannah Grimes Center for Entrepreneurship and the Keene Sentinel, but it's also a collaboration featuring local leaders from a variety of disciplines, our track leaders this year are Jessica Gelter, Executive Director for Arts Alive, who organized our arts and culture track, Amanda Littleton, District Manager for Cheshire Co County Conservation District, who leads our lands and community track, Shannon Hunley, owner of Life is Sweet, Beth Wood, Downtown Coordinator for the City of Keene, and Emily Levine Bernier, Manager of Prime Roast Coffee <coughs> Company, leaders of our Main Street track. Clean Energy was led by Pat Martin, the Monadnock Sustainability Hub. Kate Kirschhofer, former program director, and Sarah Powell, current co program director at Hannah Grimes, led her entrepreneurship hub. And I certainly want to recognize <clears throat> Uh, the folks at Hannah Grimes and at the Sentinel for their efforts on behalf of this enterprise. At Hannah Grimes, we received great assistance from Mary Ewell and Heather Lancy. Mary led our tech efforts and Heather coordinated event logistics. At the Sentinel, thanks goes to Jessica Garcia, our director for digital and design for her tech help and to Gina DeSantis, our events manager who organized the Lower Livability Idea Slam, about which I'll share more later. It's our hope in the future to add to the number of tracks we feature and to curate an idea exchange among other sectors of importance to rural communities. Recently, Radically Rural received a substantial grant from the Northern Borders Regional Commission to fund an executive director position and to make Radically Rural more of a year-round initiative and not just a once-a-year gathering. We're excited about where the next three years of that grant will take us. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our opening speaker, Becky McRae. Becky is a lifelong small town entrepreneur. 
As co-founder of Save Your Dot Town, she shares insights from her real world experience as a business owner and cattle rancher. Her practical perspective is featured at her highly ranked website, smallbizsurvival.com, and in her award-winning book, Small Town Rules. She's been featured and quoted in books, newspapers, magazines, blogs, podcasts, and university publications. She makes her home in Hopeton, Oklahoma, a community of 30 people. Her goal is to deliver, deliver practical steps that you can put into action right away and to shape the future of your town and improve many aspects of it. If you visit her website, which I highly recommend, you will receive priceless practical advice that can advance any small community. A few of my favorite recommendations. Focus relentlessly on being such a great place for your own people that others can't help wanting to be part of it. And tiny failures almost always are free, providing high quality evidence of what doesn't work. Big failures are evidence you didn't experiment small enough. And finally, if you can test an idea with duct tape and cardboard, you don't need a feasibility report. Becky McRae, welcome to Radically Rural. Thank you so much, Terry. I'm very excited to be here with everyone this morning. We're going to have a wonderful time. I do want to say get your pen and paper or your note taking device ready because we will be working. <laughs> also, um, you can send messages to me via the stage chat. We're already all everybody's waving. Shout out your hometowns and your states. It's great to see the geographic spread that we have in the room today. Now, um, the, the stage chat does come to me, but with uh, there's a 15 second delay. <laughs> so as soon as you think of something you want to tell me, you shout that right out so that it'll get to me eventually. And I will be stopping. I'll answer anything that you ask me. I'll answer in the pauses throughout the session. You know, I said we're going to work. So there'll be some pauses where we can um, where I can answer your questions. And also, I just want to say when I hit a line or I say something that you think, ooh, that was really good. I better write that down. Go ahead and repeat that in the chat box for the stage. And then that way I can repeat those at, back out to other people because somebody may have missed it. You know, they were writing or they were still working. That gives us a chance to just go back over those lines that really resonate with you and to help reinforce them in your mind and, and give us a chance to have that discussion together. Um, after this event, just as soon as the keynote is over and after Terry finishes the direction stuff, I'm going to go to my booth in the Expo Center so that you can come over there to the chat in the booth. And there's like there's a little stage chat. When you get over there, there's a little booth chat. And so we can talk a little more there as a follow up. And then, of course, you can message me directly through the hop in app. There's a chance to send a direct message to someone. So we have a chance to interact and talk. I see there's some folks from Oklahoma. So I'm just going to shout out for my Oklahoma, my New Mexico neighbors, my Arkansas. I didn't see any Kansans or the Texas. I don't know. Where's, the, where's my Texans? Um, my website is save your dot town and the book title is small town rules. It's been out for, um, oh my gosh, eight years now. Oh my, it's old. It's an old book, but <laughs> it's full of interesting stuff about business. It's more businessy. So what we're going to do right now, we're right at the moment. The timing is just perfect. So we are going to get started on the idea friendly keynote, but do take advantage of that chat. Since I don't get to see your faces and I can't, I can't get my energy from you that way. Seeing an active chat lets me know that you haven't all gone to sleep. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Deb has thrown the name of the website and the book into the chat for you there as well. All right. Here we go. 2020. This is this has been a year, hasn't it? I mean, it has really torn at the fabric of all of our communities. And the result is that we're all feeling pretty tired. I don't know about you, but I'm tired. And as a general thing, we're feeling pretty lonely and we're deeply longing for more meaningful connections with each other. We really want our neighbors to be people who help each other. We got a glimpse of that kind of real community spirit in March and April, just at the beginning of the quarantine, when it felt like we were all working together, like we were each doing what we could to be part of the whole. And we're all in this together, 
really felt like it meant something at first. But a lot has happened since then. A lot. We're not happy with where our communities, our neighborhoods are right now. Deep down, we know that our own actions play a role in what our communities will become next. So we are each trying to do something that matters in our own local communities. I know this about you because you took an entire day out of your life to come here to work on doing something that really deeply matters in your community. But we face two obstacles. First of all, it's just exhausting to keep trying to do things the same old way that we have been doing them. <laughs> and the world is changing so fast around us that the old ways are feeling completely out of step. Our traditional organizations are so full of those entrenched leaders who are still thinking the old way, that hierarchy, the formality, so many meetings, <laughs> so much plan writing, the bureaucracy and the silos. How can we expect our traditional organizations to keep up with everything that's happened this year? And, and who knows what's going to happen next year? So it's natural for us to kind of turn to online community building as, a, as another tool. It, most of us have been online for a, a decade or more now. And so we've learned how to accomplish things online. So we would take our community building efforts online and kind of go around the traditional organizations. But that is where we are running into that second obstacle right now, which is online drama. <laughs> and I mean, it's not even the regular everyday online drama that we're used to. Oh, they left a negative comment. OK, we can deal with that. What we're dealing with now are some incredibly deep online divisions that are tearing us apart. And the, the shallow algorithms in the social media channels, they just keep feeding people more of what they think we already like. And that's not helping either. We really just want to be people who help each other. Now, to get there, we're going to need a method to be a meaningful part of our local community without all the bureaucracy and without this deep online drama. So we have survived things before. Our rural communities have endured through boom and bust cycles, commodity crashes, mill and factory closures, environmental disasters, huge changes in agriculture. Your town has probably lost its economic reason for being at least once. And we have reinvented ourselves and our communities before, and we are starting to reinvent the way that we do things. So here's a real world example from the nearby town to me, Alva, Oklahoma, which is a population around 5,000 people. And there's a group of moms that decided that the old 1950s playground equipment at the city park was out of date and unsafe, which it was. <laughs> And they just started to talk to each other. How could we get some new, safe, fun equipment for our kids? So they texted each other and they messaged and they group chatted. And then they just found out what kind of equipment would work here. You can search online. You can find out what would work in your environment. So they found out where do we get playground equipment? How much money does it cost? OK, let's figure out how to raise that money. And they built groups online and they reached out over and over to involve the whole community in the discussion. And they got it done. They've actually added a bunch of equipment to the city park, but they never bothered to formalize their organization or elect officers until years later. Now, those moms just did it using the communications tools that you and I use every day. Now, you've seen examples like this, some of them that worked. And you've seen examples that have failed. Now, they didn't know it, but those moms were using the idea friendly method, or at least most of it. You start on the idea friendly method. You start with your big goal for the community. The thing that you feel is going to improve the quality of life. So that would be like kids playing safely together. And you use that goal to gather your crowd. You can help. <laughs> and then you turn your crowd into a powerful network by building connections. And then you and that network, you go out and accomplish the big goal by taking small steps. Those moms didn't start by trying to raise millions of dollars for new equipment. They started by finding the money to do a safety checkup of the old equipment. 
And they didn't start with like a full rehab. They started by fixing and removing the most dangerous sharp edges. That was the first small step. If they had tried to start with the giant thing, that wouldn't have worked. So they started by staking their claim. You take that big idea, which is the, you know, the idea is the whole area, the whole park full of new equipment, but you, you break it down and you say the claim we're staking is to have a community playground that's safe and fun for kids of all abilities to play together. And that's why they actually called their informal group the Alva Friends of Play. Would you, what a great name. So I want you to think about it. What is the claim you want to stake on your town? What is your big idea? What do you most want for your community? And so you can put these into the chat on the stage chat. And if you need a little trigger to help you think about what your big idea is, start with these sentences. And you can actually use these sentences with other people who are not sure what their big idea is. You probably know yours because you came here today. But these two questions are really useful to use with other people. And the first one is, if our town had what would you fill in there? If our town had, what would that be? And then the other one is, if our town was, what would that be? So if our town had a, a playground full of safe, fun equipment that kids of all abilities could use, that would be kind of the way that the, the Friends of Place stated it. So I'm going to let you write that down now, write your ideas down. And I'm going to pull up a picture for you to look at. And I'm going to dive into the chat and see what folks have to say. So let's do the screen share for you here. So the picture I'm showing you, this is the three parts of the idea friendly method that I ran through so quickly so that you can uh, note these down while you're writing. And I really do want you to write down a word or a sentence about what your big goal is. And Boy, look at you. Y'all have been busy in the chat. I am way behind. Okay. Lots of shout outs. This is terrific. I love seeing where y'all are from. And I love to see you talking to each other too, by the way. Like Sonia's like, yo, Nathan. I love seeing y'all shout out to each other. Okay. I do want to say like, if you just say yes, or that was so true, um, I won't know then what you were talking about. So you're going to have to tag that with what was the concept. <laughs> so I know what was that part that you really liked? <laughs> all right. Online divisiveness. OK, so we're all seeing that. Absolutely. Also, Patricia points out uh, in her town, it's very true about towns losing their economic purpose. In my town, it's been a few times. I think in a lot of towns, it's been more than once. Oh, <laughs> Lisa's right in my background. So this is my this is my uh, picture of my own local grain elevator in the town of Hopeton, Oklahoma. So, all right. Town used to be an Air Force base. There's there's a definite rebuild of your of your economic purpose. And then we're hearing from Michelle about how their park went did a grassroots movement to rebuild the park. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you, Michelle, for calling out the, the little things that I shared. Um, ooh, Lou's got a great idea. What if our town had its own recycling center? That's a goal you can get people to get behind. I love it. All right, Janet, the, our own actions play a part of the whole. And she adds, remembering we are all different and we bring different things to that same whole. Yes, yes. Clean energy, awesome. Affordable housing and a a, an absolutely thriving downtown. Great way of putting it. A vibrant, walkable downtown. A maker space. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Look at all this. This is terrific. Y'all are terrific. All right. So we're going to go on here to our next thing, which is we're going to start talking about taking small steps. So I'm going to come back here and stop that screen so that we can go on with taking small steps because that is where the magic is. With these big ideas like clean energy, man, that's a big idea. So we have to start with taking small steps. Now, the old way to take small steps in a traditional organization is meet and plan. You know the meet and plan method, right? You're going to hold some meetings. We're going to talk everything through more than once. Like we'll have a lot of going through it. And then somebody missed the meeting. So we've got to go back and catch them up. <laughs> And then we've got to search for other towns that have done it right. Like we need proof that it's going to work. We're going to compare it to the best practices. We're going to keep meeting and we'll hold some votes and we'll let everyone add to that idea. 
And then anyone can object to any part that they don't like. And then we have to take that out because it's too controversial. So you end up making your idea bigger and bigger as you add other people's stuff. And then you're taking out the other stuff. So it's becoming blander at the same time. And you can't take any action in the old way until everything is absolutely planned out and nailed down. So we're going to not do that. We have to talk about the idea friendly way that to take small steps, the idea friendly way, find the world's tiniest way to test the idea right now. You move from this model of trying to get proof before you ever try something to actually getting proof by running a test or a small experiment. So could you test with an online post and see how people react? Could we do something temporary just to see how it works? Can we do the duct tape and cardboard version of it? What's the really small version we can try just to see what happens? And lots of those ideas will fail. And in fact, most of them will fail. And author Clay Shirky says that failure is free, high quality research offering direct evidence of what works and what doesn't. And went ahead and threw that quote into the chat. Because people ask me to say it again, failure is free, high quality research, offering direct evidence of what will work and what doesn't. But by keeping our tests and trials really small and immediate, do it right now, then we can reduce the cost of failure down to the cost of duct tape and cardboard so that it's almost nothing. And then by working to draw in lots of people, hey, you bring your duct tape, we need more duct tape. <laughs> and we all get together and we build it together then you are quickly, what you are doing is you are getting so many people together. You're testing so many different ideas. You are cheaply crowdsourcing the future of your community. How cool is that? See, we all make our places every day by how we use them. And our small steps build up. And they make your community the kind of place it's going to be next. So when I talked about this, I talked about changing the trajectory of your community. Uh, science educator Steve Mayer said to me, significant change will occur with minimal force if applied over an extended period of time. And I thought, oh, that's just a killer science way to look at it. And I'm going to go ahead and share that one in the chat as well. That's It's a science way to look at it, but it's also so true in our communities. Significant change will occur with minimal force if applied over an extended period of time. So I want you to look back at your big idea for your community and think about what small step you could take right away. Who could you call or text immediately? What could you be doing this weekend to move it forward? What minimal force could you exert that would generate significant change over time? So I want you to write that down now. I want to say, as I'm looking at the chat, I see what, at least one person who said not just if our town had or was, but said, I wish, I wish my town would do this. And so we convert that wish into action by taking small steps. What one thing could you do that would move you closer to that wish? Who could you call? What could you do this weekend that would start changing that, that minimal force? Okay. Uh, Lisa points out ad, idea friendly is also called agile project management, which is a great phrase. And it and it is very it, they're at least related concepts. Um, but I will say this when you're talking to random people out in your community and you talk about agile project management, that sounds too much like the old way, like there's going to be project management and meetings and plans and stuff like that. And really, if you say, we're going to be idea friendly about this, then that just is a little less intimidating for just normal people out in your community. And that's part of the goal, right? Like draw new people in. And that's a great lead into the next thing we're going to talk about, which is to gather your crowd. 
All right. I'm, I'm just scanning through the chat to see if there's others that I absolutely have to have to. OK. All right. OK, excellent. Now we're going to gather our crowd. So how do you gather your crowd? You gather your crowd with a big idea, right? That's the big idea, the thing that excites people and makes them feel like they can play a role in it. So how you state it makes a difference, right? Like friends of play sounds like, well, I could be a friend of play. I like play. I like for our kids to play. I'm friendly. So also, don't let the word crowd throw you off, even though right now we're dealing with a pandemic. I don't want you to think it has to be big crowds in person because it could be small groups or it can be outside or it could be online or maybe it's things that are happening at different times for different people. It's just asynchronous. And so, you know, anybody can go view the mural on their own, right? like whatever you have to do to make gathering your crowd something that doesn't doesn't break the crowd rules. So, but think about the old way to gather your crowd. In the old way world, the way you gather people to work on any project is you assign them to the committee. <laughs> I mean, a real Chamber of Commerce actually sent out this email and I got a copy of it and it says, the Chamber of Commerce is planning for our, our annual programs. Please see attached <laughs> and let us know which committees you are willing to serve on. Thank you for your support. And you've gotten emails like this from people. I know you have. So there's got to be a new way, right? Like, you know, there's a new idea, friendly way to gather your crowd that is not a committee. And that is to plant the flag that people can be drawn to. They have to see a role for themselves in it. The State and Sublimity Chamber of Commerce in Oregon actually killed off their committee structure. And they only gather people when they need them now. And they use that big goal. Elena Turpin told me that they spend more time telling people how they make a difference in the community. She said, then your organization becomes a movement that people can get behind and not just another volunteer opportunity. See, there's a difference between please see attached for our volunteer opportunities and becoming a movement that people can get behind. And that difference is idea friendly. And you plant a flag because there are people out there who want to join in and they're not the regular people. Because they've been beaten down by negativity the same as you have. They're waiting for someone to start something that's idea friendly and open to them as well. Jason Roberts, who does the Better Block Project, he said that that's what always happens when they choose to improve just one street in one neighborhood. They plant that flag and people come out of the woodwork to join in, he said. Well, they were out there all the time waiting for someone to get things started. But more importantly, they were waiting for someone who would start something in a new way, in an idea friendly way. We won't come out of the woodwork for yet another typical see the attached list volunteer opportunity because we have all been burned out on that. You plant your flag to collect the people who are excited enough to take action in this new way. People who are willing to pitch in, even in a small way, are much more valuable than any number of people that are only serving because it was the volunteer opportunity and they had to sign up <laughs> or they got it pinned on them. Now, important to take a breath right here and realize not everyone will agree. Not everyone will be attracted to the flag you plant. And that's okay. They were never going to help you. You cannot lose people who were never yours. Now, the town of Pullman, Washington had a dirty sidewalk problem. Every time that it rains, there's dirt and leaves and things that just wash up out of the streets and onto their sidewalks because they're a hillside town. So it's pretty messy. And they talked about, while I was there, they talked about, we should do another cleanup day and clean up the sidewalks. But no one came to that flag. Nobody was very excited about it. But they were all like, yeah, we probably ought to do that. Do you want to do it? No, nobody wants to do it. <laughs> And so it got really quiet in the room when I said they couldn't pin it on the chamber. So then they're like, hmm, who's going to do it? And then Willow, who is a business owner, she put up her hand and she said, I will clean my own sidewalk. That's it. See, how do you get, though, from one person cleaning their own sidewalk to a crowd of people cleaning up the downtown on an ongoing basis so we don't even need an old way cleanup day? Well, you do have to start 
by cleaning your own sidewalk, right? Like you have to start there with some small action. Then you can take pictures and post it on social media and you can hashtag it, clean your own sidewalk day, right? Like that's my new hashtag, clean your own sidewalk day. So you can ask everyone to join in. And every time that Willow cleans her sidewalk, she should keep posting it and to hashtagging it. And when you clean your sidewalk, you should post it and hashtag it too. Tag some other people. When you make a big deal, how everybody could just clean their own sidewalk, then soon enough, if you are doing it, others will join you, but you have to be doing it for them to have something to join. <laughs> and maybe a lot of someone's will join. And that's what happened in Pullman. Other merchants followed Willow's lead and they all started cleaning their own sidewalks. And so then clean your own sidewalk day turned out to be Wednesday. And then the city saw what they were doing. And the city said, well, we can join in as well. We will send our street sweeper around after clean your own sidewalk day, we'll send it around in the overnight. So just sweep all your stuff over to the curb and we'll send the street sweeper around to pick it up. So that's it. That is how you gather your flag, your crowd. You plant that flag and be conspicuous doing your thing in public so people have something to join in and make it easy to join in. You know, I didn't ask you to clean all the sidewalks, just your own, just your own, clean your own sidewalk day. So what would it look like if you had your crowd together doing the first small steps of your big idea? And I want you to write that down now. What's your clean your own sidewalk day equivalent? Sonia's laughing at me because I'm reading the comments and doing the keynote. <laughs> Luckily, I have Deb Brown in there who works with me. She's part of Savior.town. We are the co-founders of it. So she's in there like answering questions, which is terrific. And Deb, if I miss one, then you shout out to me <laughs> so that I make sure to catch it. All right. I'm coming back down here and catching it. We changed the name from committee to project. Easier to join and be inclusive, which is good. Like changing the name is good as long as you also change the way it works, right? <laughs> you have to also change the way it works. Ooh, I'm hearing about Taos County, the 10 by 12 shed out of repurposed plastic, destined for the landfill, a tiny, simple thing. One demonstration project drew hundreds of people doing their own little part. It might be a seed of a movement. That's awesome, Todd. I love that. Taos County, New Mexico. Becoming a movement that people can get behind. All right. Trail enthusiasts. I'm loving seeing that. There's a lot of trail stuff going on in the chat, y'all. This is encouraging. All right. <laughs> Committee recruitment kills genuine engagement. <laughs> Sally, I'm going to quote you on that. <laughs> All right. You cannot lose, Kathleen's quoting, you cannot lose people who were never yours. Kristen also liked that one. I'm telling you what, that one, that one, when that one hit me, I'm like, oh, we're going to have to remember that. I see Deb's answering some questions. I'm catching up. Pick up your own trash. All right. So that brings me back. My friend Rob, actually, he told me he thought about clean your own sidewalk day this last week while he was walking into his grocery store and he saw some trash in the, in the parking lot. And he said, you know, normally I used to pick stuff like that up. But right now, I do not know who's been touching that with their germs, and I don't want it. <laughs> and so I reminded him, I reminded him, it's not clean up the grocery store's parking lot day. It's clean your own sidewalk day. Start with your corner of the neighborhood. Start in your community. So we're going to talk now about the fact that we know that not everybody's equally motivated to work on these things with us. And so what we're going to do going to do is we're going to talk about this curved shape. I actually want you to draw this in your notes. This is the 80-20 rule about how motivated people are to work on any project or idea. So some people we have to give, you know, really small. So like in this chart, you are the really tall part on the left, <laughs> on the left. <laughs> so you're the really tall part of that chart because you're super excited about it. 
And then the excitement who, you know, the next most excited person is like your buddy that helps you with everything. And then it just drops off from there. And so then that dotted line is like the end of the committee. This is old way. All these other people who care about it and are interested in it, they can't, they're not part of the committee. So they don't even really count. But we want to flip this model over. So we want to flip this model over on its side because the fun behavioral model tells us that people who have a really small motivation can still contribute if we ask them, if we make the size of the thing we ask them match their motivation level. So knowing that not everybody's as motivated of you as you, instead of seeing yourself as isolated on the left in the committee, see yourself as the foundation. And then we give small but meaningful ways to contribute to all these other people. So go ahead and draw this curve in your notes as well and see yourself as the foundation. And how can you give people really small and even smaller and very tiny and really, really tiny ways that they can contribute if they care? even a little bit, like how can you make it so that even like being part of the online group, if you'll click like, if you'll click share, it helps us, right? So you don't have to cut off everybody anymore. You can let their contributions add up. Let their contributions add up. Okay, so next up is we're going to talk about um, building connections because you've started by taking small steps and then you gathered your crowd with your big idea. And so now we want to turn that crowd into a powerful network by building connections. So here's a specific example in Idaho, economic developer, Jessica told me she's dying to get a microbrewery in her town. So she's been going around telling everyone she meets like you should open a microbrewery. <laughs> and it, it hasn't worked yet because she's not quite there, but Think about the old way to get a microbrewery. The old way is like Jessica could, could bring it up at a meeting of, the, of her economic development board. They can refer it to the subcommittee. The subcommittee can order the feasibility study. Uh, they can eventually add it to the plan. And then they can order Jessica as the director to watch the um, those lists of companies that are looking to relocate those RFP lists. So she can watch those to see if a microbrewery pops up somewhere. Or they could start negotiating with another microbrewery and see if they could get a branch opened in their town. So that's all the old way. Now, what? like there has to be a new idea friendly way. Why don't we just start a homebrew group? Like, let's just bring together people who are interested in beer, people who like to brew their own beer, like maybe start an online group on Facebook, or then we can get them together in the same place, maybe somebody's backyard, let them share ideas, let them share recipes, let them just talk. Right. Like, you know what's going to happen if you get a bunch of home brewers together, like they're going to drink a lot of beer, but then they're going to eventually someone is going to make the leap, right? Like somebody will start a brewery. You probably know a microbrewery that started with someone who made the leap. But this is different by giving them this supportive group of other home brewers. We are making them much more likely to succeed at their microbrewery when they go commercial because they'll have other people to encourage them to help with connections to suppliers or to find other brewers who have made the leap that can help mentor them. Or they can help them work out problems. Or maybe those home brewers are going to volunteer to help staff the microbrewery on the launch. That's the idea friendly way. Informal, chaotic, a crowd of people just sort of testing things openly connecting and doing small steps. So we're going to pause. <laughs> Deb, is there anything I need to see in the chat? You've got 15 seconds to toss it out here for me. Excellent. Excellent. I'm seeing some good stuff in the chat. How do you get people to even click like is a good question for Mary. Listen, if they're not, if they won't click like, then there's something about the way it's been stated or the way it's been presented. They don't see themselves in it. So maybe they just don't even like that idea. That's probably why they didn't click like. Or maybe they're not online people and that's not the right match of asking them to do the click like thing. Maybe that's just not the kind of thing they'd rather do. There's probably some other thing that they would rather do if they do actually like the idea. All right. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Fit the ideas to the people, the level of motivation that people have. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about 
how we make community happen, because there's a lot of that, like you need to build community. Like, how do we do that? Well, community happens when people talk to each other. And the good news is people love to talk to each other. They like to talk online. They like to talk in person. And that's builds connections for us. And then by connecting more different people in more different ways, we're building social capital, that magic thing, social capital. We're building better connections inside of our groups with people who are like us. But we also want to start bridging across to diverse communities who are not like us, people all over our communities and connect as well. And so by reducing the size of what we're asking, we're making it a lot easier for all different kinds of people to join in. Professor Brian Uzi from Northwestern University says that when you get more diverse people involved, you get more innovative ideas. Makes sense, right? Like different people know different things. People raised in different families or different cultures or in different places will have ideas that are even more different from yours. And we will innovate more and come up with more innovative ideas to sol find solutions to our problems that our communities face. And we need innovative ideas. We need innovative ideas because our 1950s ideas won't serve us any better today than that 1950s playground equipment. So I want you to look back at your big If Our Town idea that you wrote down and think about what could you do to get people together to actually do it? And what really tiny ways can people be involved? So what's the equivalent of the homebrew group for you? Or what's the equivalent of something like Clean Your Own Sidewalk Day where there's little tiny ways to participate? So try to cut down the size of what people need to do and give people a chance to community happens when people talk to each other. So I'll give you a moment to work on those. And I'm way behind on the chat. <laughs> I see y'all innovating around this whole clothesline idea, which is terrific. All right. <laughs> Nancy says, we found that microbreweries are like rabbits. <laughs> they breed fast and suddenly you have a craft brewing cluster. <laughs> that, I'm telling you, if you get home brewers together in a club, then you will end up, they will breed like rabbits, right? Like that's going to happen. All right. Excellent stuff. Okay, so let's kind of bring things to a, to a close here. We're going to start wrapping up because I, and I want you to write this one down. I want you to write this one down. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to, I'm going to throw back because I just saw something from Amy in the chat that I'm going to change. I'm going to change directions right quick. She says, how do we move those who are really attached to the 1950s ideas along? And I'm going to go back to what did we say? What did we say? They were never going to help you. You cannot lose the people who were never yours. If they're stuck in the 50s, let them be stuck in the 50s. You can share information like this with them, but don't expect that they will change. You cannot lose those people because they were never yours. Okay. And then at the very end of this, I'm going to give you a, a, a chance to get the 30 minute video you can share with others, but just don't expect that they'll change, right? Like just look for the people who want to come in right? Clean your own sidewalk day. We don't go knock on anybody's door and say, you haven't cleaned your sidewalk. We say, we're doing it. Join if you want. Okay. So that's kind of a whole different. <laughs> and I don't mean, Amy, I hope you don't take any of that personally because all of that, we run into that in all the communities. All right. So back to what I was going to do. We need to wrap up here. We've got about five minutes left. So I want to, I, and I do want you to write this one down. I hope you wrote down, you can't lose people who are never yours, but you do want to write this one down as well, which is you don't have to know all the answers. You just have to be open to new ideas. Deb, you can repeat that one in the chat for me. You don't have to know all the answers. You just have to be open to new ideas. Iowa State University studied 99 small towns over a 20 year time period. And in that time, those towns experienced every kind of change that you can imagine. Some of them lost a manufacturer and then others gained a new business. And some were, some of them actually lost their school and then others had big boosts of enrollments in their school. 
Some were hit by natural disasters and others were spared. What the researchers concluded out of those 99 small towns is that no matter what happened to them or didn't happen to them, the towns that prospered best were the towns that were open to new ideas and open welcomed new people into decision making. Being open to new ideas requires us to let go of worrying about whether the idea is even going to work. You want to move from picking just one idea that you think is the most likely to succeed to trying all of the ideas. You want to move from voting to testing ideas. Instead of deciding which ones you think will work, you are learning which ones will work by actually doing them in very small tests. And here's an example. This is one of those ideas that probably wouldn't get picked if we like did a vote. Vote on the best ideas. And that's a rock hunt. It's a really simple idea. You may know of a town that does this. You take small rocks and you paint them with something cheerful and encouraging. And then you hide those rocks around, say, in your downtown. And then people get out with their kids and they hunt for rocks. And then when you find it, you can post a picture of it online. And that encourages others to participate as well. And then if you love the rock, you can keep it. <laughs> and if not, you can put it back. If you keep the rock, then you paint a replacement and you hide that, right? So it's fun. It's just silly fun. It's something it also, it you know, social distancing and mask wearing works with it as well. But it's also real community building. I mean, we want to be the kind of community where our people actually you know, get out as families and do things together. And maybe that's our flag is our big idea. We want to be people who do nice things for other people in our community. Maybe that's our flag. Maybe we want to be the place that supports healthy families and kids. So Bolivar, Missouri did one of these. And in seven days, they had like 3000 people join their Facebook group. And that is like the equivalent of the entire population of Bolivar. So the city administrator got interviewed and said, if you set up 10 different things and said, which of these things do you think will spark the community and take off? I don't know if this is the one I would have picked. And that's the point. We don't know which one idea will work. So there is no point to setting up 10 different ideas and trying to vote or trying to pick. Just let 10 people test 10 ideas or 100. Consensus does not come from voting on what most of the people would want or trying to compromise until the majority of the people in the room can reluctantly agree. Think about that meeting room in Pullman, Washington with the dirty sidewalks. If we had held a vote right then, then I'm sure the majority would have voted for holding yet another traditional old way cleanup day, even though it had not worked to create lasting change. The consensus emerged from the actions that people were motivated enough to take. And the whole group may not go the direction you like, and they sure won't do it the way we've always done things, but when you plant your flag, then you pick the direction you go. You clean your own sidewalk. And the people who want to do that will come with you. And don't worry too much about the others. It will never go back to the way it was. You have to start from right here and go forward one small step at a time. Now, I, the last thing I want to share with you is the idea of friendly creed. It's something you can use to help identify other people who are excited about this way of doing community building. And I'll, I'll show you uh, the start of it. It's right here. Here's the start of it. And let me read just a little bit of it to you. We are a community of possibilities, not of problems. We are the action takers. We are optimistic. It is not about what this town used to be. It's about starting right where we are. We have people and assets right now. We don't need another committee or another plan. We take action right away. We create moments that show what this town could be, even if it only lasts a little while. It doesn't have to be permanent to create possibility. We don't care about titles or who holds official positions. The people who hold titles may not think like us, and that's okay. No one can stop us from doing the little things that really matter. We would rather help 10 people try their own ideas 
then hold a vote to pick one winner. Voting might be more efficient, but efficiency isn't our goal. Community is our goal. We try everyone's ideas. We don't let statistics or negative reports beat us up. We know that those numbers are nothing but a snapshot in time. What we do next is up to us. We aren't changing our town to try to attract other people. We are valuing all the people who are here now. And we are creating the future of our town together. And that means everyone, every single one, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all incomes, people who are new in town and people whose families have been here for generations. All of us have ways of doing things, culture and gifts to share. We all want a thriving town with a future for generations. We thrive by doing more business together. We celebrate the entrepreneurs and the business people and the dreamers and the makers and the artists, the experimenters, the performers and crafters, the bakers, the upcyclers, the junkers, people who sell in booths and homes and parking lots and trucks. Together we prosper right here where we are. We have everything we need and we are creating the community we want one small step at a time. It is nothing short of a revolution in how we build our town together. Welcome to an idea-friendly town. That was the idea-friendly creed. And you can download a copy of that from saveyour.town. And if you'd like to speak with me, um, I will be going to my booth at the in the expo booth. And um, that gave you goosebumps. Thank you, Kristen, because you know what? It actually gives me goosebumps when I read it. <laughs> So I will be in my chair in the expo booth for just like 10 or 15 minutes. And also, if you were just thinking, oh, I really wish somebody had heard this, then you can um, sign up for a free 30 minute bonus video there as well. And that'll be in the booth. You go to the expo icon on the left side and search for Becky. <laughs> that will take you to my booth. Um, and then when you get there, make sure you're in the booth chat, like you're in stage chat right now. You want to go to booth chat when you get there. And I want to thank you all so much for your time and your attention and for sharing your thoughts. I'm going to try to save this. I hope I can save this whole chat because, wow, you guys have shared a lot of really great ideas and I want to follow up with you. So thank you so much. And now Terry Williams is coming back to tell you how to find in all the sessions today and how to get around. Oh, good. You've saved the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you very much, Becky. That was really inspiring. I think the concept of an idea friendly is just a great path for any of us to be on for our businesses, for our communities, and particularly our organizations. So uh, you have our deepest gratitude for being with us today and getting us off to such a great start. So thank you so much. Um, I next need to provide some housekeeping items that I hope will help you navigate this online event. Here are some things you're going to want to know about for Hopin, which is what we are staging this event on. There's an FAQ available in the event chat box for you to look at at any time if you encounter an issue. We've also got some tech support standing by. So if you encounter a problem or a question, email to radicallyrural at hannahgrimes.com. If you're not doing so, please use either Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox for browsers. They work best on Hopin. You can access all aspects of our event by clicking on the menu items on the left-hand side of the screen. You are now on the stage and you will shortly go from here and enter sessions where you will scroll through the options and select the one that you want to attend. You can leave a session at any time and go to another simply by leaving one session and selecting another session option. Sessions start promptly at 9, 11, and 2, and will last approximately an hour and 45 minutes. You can enter a session 10 minutes ahead of time. You're probably going to find your speakers already there working dil diligently on their presentations, much like you would see at any conference. They will get going on time. You'll be muted and not on video when you are in a session, so please don't share your video and audio unless you are a speaker, presenter, or a moderator. We hope you will return to the stage at 1 p.m. for the Lively Lore Foundation Livability Idea Slam. This is a fast-paced showing of videos from presenters who, through their work, have made their communities more livable and their companies more sustainable. You will get to vote through a poll tab on which, on which video left you most inspired or impressed. 
We thank Lohr for their sponsorship of this event. Also on the stage at 2 p.m. is our live Pitchfork Finals, during which four entrepreneurs buy for a $10,000 prize and two companies compete for $1,000 for the best business idea. And then at 4 p.m., we will be back on stage for our closing speaker, John Molinaro, who has led economic development in the Appalachian region of Ohio. You can interact with speakers on the stage or in a session. Simply use the chat function as you've just done with Becky. And then you're gonna find that on the right-hand side of the screen. Our hope is that our speakers will have time to handle all chat questions. They'll get through as many as time allows. The chat, polls, and people tabs can be minimized during our event by hitting the small tab in the top right of the screen. Hit the button again to enlarge it. The chat tab, of course, allows you to submit questions. You will also see important messages from speakers or organizers here, including links to materials about which you might have an interest. This is a good place to look for presentations that speakers have provided for downloads. We will use the polls feature to ask you questions and get your feedback. These polls are event-wide and will appear randomly over the day. The People tab displays all participants in our events. You can send a direct message to any participant by simply clicking on their name. This is a great way to ask a private question, reconnect with a friend or contact or a colleague. A red dot in the recipient's People tab and on the envelope icon, which is at the top right, will let them know that, you, that they have a new message. The attendee will receive a direct message letting, letting them know that you've invited them to a video call. You will both receive a link to a private session room within Hopin. The room will allow up to five people to share their webcam, so you can share the link. The event chat is for conference-wide discussions. It's accessible on every page on the platform. The stage and session chats are for discussions during stage or session presentations. Only attendees at the stage event or session event will see these chats. Networking. While radically rural remote attendees won't be able to meet someone in a conference room, you can meet attendees through one-on-one -on -one video networking by clicking the networking icon on the left side of your screen. When an attendee clicks the ready button, they are immediately matched with a random fellow attendee via face-to-face -face video. Meetings end automatically after 90 seconds unless you choose to speak longer by hitting the extend button. Attendees can leave at any time. Conversation partners may decide to share contact information by clicking the connect button. If both parties click connect, the pair can find each other's contact information like email address and social media via the connect section of their Hopin account. Be sure to visit our virtual exhibit floor where sponsors and participants have set up vendor booths. You may find instructive videos, contact information, additional resources in those booths, and you can leave behind your own contact information to be connected later. Recordings of events on the stage and in sessions will be made available following the close of the event. To gain access, we are using eureka.biz. So that's U-R-E-E-K-A dot biz, which is a tech pl platform dedicated to underserved entrepreneurial communities. Radically Rural has set up a dedicated Radically Rural group at in Eureka, where you can continue to share ideas, events, and other news year round. Links to all the videos will be there following the event, though it may take us a little bit of time to get them all posted. You can sign up for Eureka for free using the registration code that was sent to all attendees via email. We will also put the link to Eureka and the code in the event chat. Remember, there is a full schedule and description of all sessions in the sessions part of this platform and on the Radically Rural website. So that should cover instructions for how to use this platform. You can consult the FAQ anytime throughout our event chat. And please, if you run into any technical issues, email radicallyrural at hannahgrimes.com. With that, thank you for attending Radically Rural. We hope you find this event helpful. And please be sure to let us know your thoughts through chat. And also, everyone will receive a survey for your feedback following Radically Rural. Enjoy your day.